this is something that I've uh, been looking at uh, for a couple of years now in terms of attempting to categorize and um, also enumerate technology in terms of uh, what it can do for you. This basically is uh, me. Um, I, I have been uh, teaching for SANS for a long time. I've been dealing with security operations for a long time. Um, you'll get a, lo a longer introduction of me in a, in a, uh, in a later uh, talk. But the idea here is that as I've helped people dealing with their security operations centers, um, there is no single, I want to go buy a SOC. Right? There's no you know, um, code that I can go out and say to a vendor, sell me a SOC. And, and some vendors are starting to put together portfolios of products, but it still is a combination of you buy this and you buy this and you buy this. Oh, and you'll need some pro, uh, you know, protocols inside of your uh, organization and you'll need to build playbooks. And no, we don't have a way to do that. And yes, there's some community references to be able to do that. So this is something where it's um, us left to our own devices um, to enumerate all of the different technology that's available and then make a decision about how we're going to stitch these things together and how we're going to provide us with the coverage that we need in order to protect our environment. In order to do that, we're gonna to need to get various aspects of data, threat intelligence and other components and pull those in. Oh, and then we're gonna need tools in order to be able to pull all of that data in and map it to our, um, you know, our information that we have inside of our environment. And what I found, and what you have probably found as well, is that there are a lot of vendors who are gonna tell you a lot of different stuff, but most of the data that's out there around what tools do is largely produced by the vendors themselves. And they have an interest in depicting the rosiest picture possible about what those tools are actually doing. And they, they are, are giving us good information and giving us tools because without their tools, we wouldn't be able to do this stuff that we're trying to do but there isn't anything that I was ever able to find that said, hey, here is an objective and a real world picture of what tools are. Now, I don't have that yet myself. Um, it's something that I'm trying to build a framework that lets us then have the discussion about what tools are. And, and this talk is going to show you two different um, attempts that I have made in order to uh, characterize uh, and categorize technology that's actually out there. Okay. So the um, first one, actually this is the second one. This came second, but I'm gonna talk about it in the talk first because um, it's actually less mature than the second one, the first one. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is uh, basically a pass on the technology taxonomy that I did for the most recent SOC survey. Um, that I was actually I had a bit of a constraint imposed on me in that there was certain sets of technology that I had to deal with. It was a bunch of questions and the questions were saying, hey, do you use this technology in your SOC? And if you do use it, are you happy with it? Okay. And so I started thinking about how to depict these questions to people, how to organize the technology, because basically it was this list of, uh, you know, something like 50, um, 50 parts of this, okay? 50 different technologies that um, I didn't want to have one question that had 50 technologies in it, right? And so I said, okay, let me go to uh, in, uh, sort of uh, in, uh, something out in the ecosystem that is intended to give us a framework in which we can then put our tools and decide on what they do. And so the cybersecurity framework from NIST actually uh, is, a, is basically a depiction. It says, we identify, we protect our stuff. We detect that the attackers are actually um, causing problems for us. After detecting, we respond. And then after responding, we actually recover and put things back to normal. Okay, so I thought, oh, this is actually a good place to start. I've got these buckets. I can take the specific list of tools that I have, and I can then map each of the tools into these different buckets and, uh, and you know, basically ask the question, do you use this in your SOC as a technology? And if you do, how happy are you with the technology? regardless of what the specific tool is that you've purchased or that you're using, how happy 
are you with the one that you selected? Okay. And so the stuff that ended up going into the identify bucket was asset discovery and inventory, log management, and then risk analysis and assessment. Um, and so this is, uh, this is basically the stuff that we have in our identify, um, in our identify category. In the protect category, and this is interesting, just, just looking at the numbers of where um, tools end up in, we have a lot of stuff in protect. Right? These are things that are there, that are technologies that get overlaid onto the IT infrastructure that we have that are intended to make it so that those things do stuff in a safe way. Okay? And so these are tools like uh, you know, doing filtering, specific filtering on, on um, network traffic that's moving out of our environment, or specific filtering on network traffic that's attempting to come into our environment. And our security tool is going to sit in line and watch and then stop if it sees something that's bad. Um, our inline detonation, our uh, access control type things for networks, our firewalls of our various different uh, generations and so on, um, or firewalls that get put in place to be inline content inspection in, in front of our web applications. Okay. The detect is actually even longer. It's, hey, let's look at this stuff. We're not going to do anything about it. You know, we're not going to actually stop it, but we're going to use this in order to uh, differentiate normal versus potentially abnormal or normal versus unacceptable. Um, and so, you know, long list of uh, technologies that we had in this in terms of some stuff on the endpoints, some stuff on the networks. Is it behavioral? Is the, uh, you know, the person coming from a geographic location that's weird? Can we apply some sort of machine learning to that so that instead of having to have analysts do this work, um, we have machines making decisions behind this? Um, do we have PCAP inspection? Can we collect threat intelligence in some sort of a way that then is applied to the data that we have? Right? And so uh, these things become our, uh, our detective capability. And then, all of a sudden, we start getting into some very, very short lists. The response, and this is fascinating to me, how much technology is really directed specifically to response? And th there, kind of, there isn't a lot. Um, the deception actually occurs in a couple of different places um, in this listing. Um, on, the one way, on the one hand, you can use it for, um, for um, detection, but you can also use it for response. I could take a potential um, problematic system and drop it over into a different VLAN and let it interact with a whole bunch of fake systems to see if it's, if it's bad. Like from just a, a containment perspective, which would be a part of your response portfolio, I can contain by putting it into an alternate VLAN. Um, the DDoS stuff is when you come under DDoS attack, um, you know, you might have somebody doing upstream scrubbing for you and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of products that are actually out there. And then, um, and we're starting to move into this more with, uh, with tools, and I'm trying to not mention very specific vendors. I'm trying to, you know, step away from this. But the idea that I have something that's an agent that's on my endpoint that I can actually tell that to then do something to contain that particular, uh, that particular program that's running, or I can utilize that endpoint detection and response to say, give me more data to let my analyst make a decision to then decide to block it or um, contain it or cha make changes in the firewall and so on, right? And then recovery, and this again is something that most people do recovery in very much of uh, non-security technology perspective, but more of an operational perspective. There's not a lot of um, crossover that I see and cross-linking between normal IT operations and then security aspects. Okay, so this is, this is basically uh, one way that we listed these things. And you might like that way, okay? And I'm, I'm presenting that to you. I didn't love the way that it worked in our SOC survey. I'll talk about that again later, but it was actually a, a good sort of um, way to approach it from the SOC survey. This is something that I came up with, um, which is a little bit different. Uh, this was uh, material that I had uh, sort of initially written for the Management 517 class. Um, and then I didn't like the way I did that, so I stepped back and I said, I need to come up with different buckets to be able to aggregate this uh, set of technology in order to be able to express to people what they probably need to buy. Okay. And in this case, I'm actually going to talk 
as some examples of specific vendor things, but I'm gonna go through and say, here's what I think that you need. And, and, and this, uh, this is, again, my opinion extracted from my experience with uh, you know, um, customers and, and um, in working in environments, and it is an attempt to give you a basis to say, do I have this stuff, and can I map what the tools that I do have do for me, and can I identify gaps? Okay. So these are the overall categories, and I'm going to go through and uh, list these. So visibility, external awareness, the idea that I am using technology to be able to show my analysts what the state of the environment is, because things change constantly. We need to adapt and adjust to what's happening. And I have weather on there, because actually that probably plays a big part <laughs> in terms of uh, the way that things are going in your environment. And then I also have internet weather. as the temperature changes on the internet as new threats come out, when all of a sudden a treasure trove of tools that were stolen from a nation state actor get dumped on the, uh, you know, on the internet, all of a sudden you need to do something about that. And how you're maintaining that visibility is probably a technology underneath that that's actually doing that. And that technology may be my analysts are actually looking at their Twitter feeds on their computers, but you may also have different tools to be able to actually uh, accomplish that. Um, the communication technology that you have in place in terms of how you do this. Um, this is something that I want to have a lot of control over the messaging in my, uh, in my SOC. I don't want to allow things to get outside of the SOC um, environment. And, you know, you may be using Slack to do this, um, and you may actually be comfortable with moving that information to some third party sites. And if that's your comfort level, great. But I would like to make sure that I'm controlling all of the messaging around that. I, I primarily don't want to use email. Um, I don't want to be notifying people over email unless I have to. I would prefer to have some sort of a portal where I can use all sorts of notifications telling people, hey, you've got something relevant to the security operations that you need to look at, but you need to come back to our place where we're depicting that information so we can show you that. Okay, so that includes the, you know, the portals that we have in order to manage that communication aspect. Our operational aspect of our, uh, of our environment gives us all of our automation, all of our orchestration, all of our ticketing. And then, and this is something that I think a lot of SOCs are guilty of, and then it also gives us a dev QA and stage environment prior to our production environment. And a lot of people who build socks don't approach it from the perspective of, yes, I also need to buy enough stuff to be able to do dev QA and stage. If you don't have that, you're doing it wrong. You, as the sock, are the defense for your organization, and you should have the same level of, or probably even a little bit better, um, basis of performance for uptime, consistency, and testing prior to stuff gets getting pushed out into, uh, into production. And you can't get excellent uptime and performance without having good test environments that very closely emulate where you're going to be actually running things. We have the detection and the prevention uh, things, and here I'm talking about endpoint, network, infrastructure, ex extra structure, uh, which is what I call all of your uh, environments that are now out in the cloud and other places. Um, so we need a way to be able to both instrument those environments and then act within those environments in order to do work. And then we need something to help us with our correlation. And we typically look at this from a SIM perspective, um, but this is, uh, this is basically whatever you use, I don't care what it is, I, most, I see most people using it as a SIM, but whatever you use in order to look at all this abundance of data and make sense of it. Uh, the storage is long-term aggregation, um, you need to also consider, if you're running a SOC, how you're going to um, compartmentalize and segregate some of this data, because this is something that a lot of people actually have uh, sort of multiple customers if you're in sort of a managed environment, uh, managed security provider type environment, or constituents if you're inside of an organization where you have not customers per se, but people that you need to take care of. You have to think about separating that data and making sure that information doesn't necessarily bleed over when your analysts are taking information from one space and um, inadvertently um, providing it to people with different responsibilities. Um, Long-term retention, 
physical controls. I'm actually really excited about Deviant's talk tomorrow, talking about physical controls, because it's something that not a lot of people, when they think about their socks, are actually considering. If I were an attacker, I'd love to target the sock um, physically in order to, uh, to interrupt it, and there are a lot of different ways that that can happen. Uh, deception capability um, and all of our different uh, ways to do this, honey tokens, honey pots, um, full networks in order to do deception. Um, analytical tools, so we'll hear things as we go in the, uh, in the next couple of days about the models of analysis. Most of your analysts, and we talk about this a lot, SOC analysts, most of your analysts are using tools to do analysis. What's the tool that they're most commonly are using in order to do that analysis? They're probably using the SIM to do that analysis. And actually, I don't think that's a great place for this. I want them to have stuff, technology, dedicated to allowing them to do analysis. I want baseline systems. I want test systems. I want them to be able to draw correlations between elements of data that allow them to um, basically enumerate nodes and show what happened. I want them to be able to do timelining. I want them to be able to simulate what happened so that when they come up with a theory, they've got a way to be able to test as to whether or not that's valid or not. That takes a lot of technology in order to get that set up. And it might just be, hey, another version of the workstation that we have in our environment, but I want that dedicated and I want people thinking in advance to make sure that they have that arranged. So I have a couple of, uh, a couple of lists. And for me, to, to make sense of this for a broad audience, I talk about open source, um, moderate priced, and then enterprise tier. And so open source got a bunch of free tools. And you know, sometimes these tools are really great, um, but we're doing things where we've got, okay, I'm just pulling this information. I've got the, uh, you know, the external awareness because I'm um, aggregating threat intelligence. And so I'm looking at threat and connect Threat Connect and OTX and MITRE's attack framework and all that sort of stuff. And I might be using the Hive and RTIR in order to look at that. Um, Long-term storage, basically I'm taking the data that I have and putting it into some sort of uh, an offline storage mechanism in order to be able to actually um, you know, look at that for the long term. And then um, from a deception, I'm basically cobbling this together in order to make it work. And with analysis, basically I'm using a bunch of tools that I have that I can create environments to do this test type stuff. From the moderate perspective, we tend to start to spend our money in the uh, correlation tools. Um, we tend to start to spend our money on the, uh, you know, on the orchestration automation. Um, those are the things that I see people tending to actually do. Um, they get sort of a better ticketing, uh, they get a better, uh, uh, you know, a better long-term storage mechanism, maybe leveraging cloud type stuff. Um, from the analysis perspective, they start to leverage more attack tools and um, commercial capabilities in order to be able to demonstrate um, the relationships between things. So we're seeing stuff like case file and Multego and other sort of uh, transformational tools to be able to look at the analytical portions of it. Um, so it says uh, typical open source in the title, but that's not correct because this is the enterprise stuff. So we start to see, um, you know, from the enterprise perspective, people that are actually um, selling you um, tools that help you to get visibility, um, better ticketing, um, larger scale sort of uh, orchestration automation, um, specific technologies dedicated just to deception. Um, Long-term storage is usually still just using um, you know, big storage environments, but using enterprise uh, grade capabilities. And then we're seeing a lot more sort of uh, pictures of analytical um, tools that are pretty much set to do that. Okay. This is my um, depiction of what I see. And this is my attempt to help you to categorize this sort of amorphous mess of the different technology. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, the, um, the picture that I have of that. And you can look at the details of this sl slide deck later. Um, I wanna say a couple of other things and then John's gonna come up and talk about how you might be using some of this, uh, some of this technology. First of all, your SOC is your defense. This is the last layer, right? So you should be protecting your information systems that are defining that SOC 
with at least as good the same level of control or better than the systems that the SOC is intended to, to actually protect. Right? This should be at least as well run and at least as well fortified as the systems that you're trying to protect. You need to, anytime that you think about buying a technology, plan for the ongoing care, feeding, and updating, and continual integration and use of this tool in your environment. That is way more expensive, <laughs> oftentimes, than buying the tool itself. You're gonna need to train and maintain people's capability on these tools. You might need to hire somebody or outsource the capability to actually support that particular technology. Okay. What I have seen is that in the smaller socks, it usually grabs a person from somewhere else inside of the environment and says, hey, you're gonna help us do this now too. Okay. And then in the larger socks, they tend to have uh, dedicated teams. I will get to some specific data around this in uh, the talk that I gave at the end of the day today. And interoperability is a big deal where you may find tools that uh, work very well together, and that's great. Um, but if you, don't actually, uh, if you don't actually find ways to make the data glued together, then you're gonna actually have, uh, have problems. And so what are you gonna do to get the data from system to system? One is that you just have somebody that's really good at scripting that actually makes that happen. Another is you engage professional services from an external entity that you say, we're gonna bring this thing in, I need you for a month or three months come in and make it work in my environment so that the data is getting between them. Um, another thing is that you have some sort of an orchestration tool that actually uh, you know, sits on top of all these things and moves the data between the different uh, technologies to make it work. Think about where the tools go. You may have people in different regions and you can't move data out of that region. If you have stuff in, uh, in Europe, now you have a challenge where you might not allow your analysts um, outside of Europe to see the data related to Europe, so you might need to buy tools for uh, se several different places. And so when you uh, think about buying this technology, you want to consider how you're going to make this work, long-term vendor relationship, customization and configurability is a good selection criteria if you're actually gonna do it. If you don't have a way to customize and configure, then you probably wanna buy things that are a little more boilerplate from the get-go. And then making sure that you can actually um, um, support this for the long term. So I'm kind of running out of time, uh, so I want to actually uh, invite John up, who is going to uh, start to talk about how he sees some ways that uh, you would actually use this taxonomy and some of the things about how uh, his experience leads you to get a sense of um, what makes sense for this. So. All right, thanks, Chris. Good news is there's only three more PowerPoint slides between you and lunch. The bad news is the last two slides have like a million builds each, but I'll, I'll be a quicker clicker upper here as we go. So um, a lot of what I do at SANS uh, and what I did at Gardner before coming to SANS was work with security teams and CISOs, help them communicate with upper level management, with CEOs and boards to help get the resources and the, and the, the, the change backing we need to do what we need to do in security. So when Chris asked me to look at his taxonomy, First thought was, well, yet another taxonomy, but my second thought was, wait a minute, he's done some cool things in here, particularly listing open source as part of the equation, and the second was the identification of moderate and advanced levels, um, and I'll tie that into a second. So um, some of the things I've done at SANS, you know, between uh, SOC operations, how to convince upper level management to invest in maturing the SOC, and that's an example you see in the graphic there. But in my talk with boards to say, what do you need to hear or what are you hearing from security teams and CEOs, the two biggest complaints were the security people are very tactical. It's always threat of the month. They're never laying out sort of this series of steps that need to uh, take nothing strategic. We're not hearing anything strategic from them. Second thing is we're not hearing anything about business benefit. We do make this investment in improving the SOC and it moves up these levels. How do we notice what gets better from the company's point of view, from the customer's point of view, from the, from, from the profit point of view or whatever. So ideally, here's what boards would like to see. I, I spent two, so many years at Gartner, I can only think in two by two matrices, I'm sorry. So the next two slides will look very similar. Um, what they'd like to know is, are we safe enough? Are you keeping the business and our customers safe enough? That's the bottom, the level of protection. And are we spending too much or too little? 
Do we need to spend more? Are we inefficient? We're spending too much. So if you think about the different places you might be, at the bottom, at the bottom left, if you're not giving enough security, we're not safe enough, and we're not spending a lot, then we're just flying blind and bad things may happen. If we look at the exact opposite level, at the very top, we're, way too sec we're more secure than we need to be and we're spending a lot of money, then that's, we're, we're wasting much. Great job if you can get it. Anybody here work at a company that just gives you everything you need? If you did, we'll all give you our resumes here uh, at, at the next break. The real key things come in those other two categories. Maybe we're, we're um, spending, we're claiming we're secure, but we're spending uh, a lot of money and we're really not secure. So we're spending a lot of money on security, but we're constantly showing up in the news and getting broken into. That's the upper, upper left. And the bottom side is we're giving really good protection, but somehow we figured out how to do it at a very low amount of spending in security, which actually happens out there. It's not, not unheard of to see that. Ideally, the board, like, they'd like to say we're in that Goldilocks zone in the middle, right? Our security, our safety level's about right. We're spending about equal to what other people in our industry are spending. That's how management, that's how CEOs and boards judge things compared to others in their industry. It's never in a vacuum. Um, so if we sort of translate that more to the real world, um, they want to know where you, we are now and what your plan is to get to that Goldilocks zone. So if you're up there saying, well, we're spending more than average and we're not getting enough security, well, then we need some tools to get more efficient. We need to be able to do some things that raise the level of protection and hopefully lower the amount of spending a little bit. If we're in this upper, upper here, we're spending way too more, well then obviously too much, we want to figure out how to reduce our level of spending and maybe we give up a little bit of security. You know what the number one complaint about the cost of security is? That the business side is saying security is getting in our way. Security says it's gonna take six weeks to okay that connection with the new business partner or it's gonna take three months to uh, check the software for vulnerability. So it's not always just a security cost of how much we're spending, it's also removing obstacles from the business. Now, another one is if we're down in that, we're flying blind without a net, maybe something bad happened and we do get money, it's pretty simple. We've gotta show over time how we're gonna move up in both the level of protection and how much we're spending. The worst possible thing is this, is we don't really know where we are, and we're just going to try various things and we'll report to you each month. That's what boards commonly complain we're doing in security is we're not able to say where we are and every month, well, we've got to do this, it's ransom, we've got to do that, it's, it's crypto, oh, we've got to do this, it's now called strategic um, oper uh, operations and automation type things. So when I saw Chris's taxonomy, it made me think we have a cool tool that we can sort of use to address this kind of issue to management. So again, I'm just from the bottom line is how much we spend in the, in the overall security budget, and they may think of that as how much money they might give you for products and services. On the left or the up and down, that's the level of skills in our staff. That could be a number of people times skills, or small number of highly skilled people, a large number of medium skilled people, a mix. That depends on your business environment. Same goal of how do we say, here's where we are and how do we get to the, the Goldilocks zone in the middle. So if you think about it now in the lower left, if you don't have a lot of money and a lot of staff, you're probably going to be looking at managed security service providers, other forms of outsourcing, or simply some IT system integrator who's really running everything and doing security. If you've got um, lots of staff, but still not, a lot of not procurement budgets, then that's where key area of maximizing open source. One thing I found in doing the quantitative interviews around the SOC survey was that a lot of um, security teams that are using open source and have built the tools tend to have the lowest turnover. You know, the fear of using open source is always that the knowledge walks out the door when that person leaves. When you look at the Googles of the world and larger, they're using a lot of open source and they have some of the lowest levels of turnover in their security operations staff because they're building really cool stuff and it's really effective. So that's one way of doing things. If you look at this side, we've got um, not that many people, but uh, we can spend a lot of money. Well, then we're probably doing things like, yeah, we've got managed service providers. We have a, uh, uh, in, uh, retainers with you know, Mandiant or Verizon or whoever to come in and do incident response if something happens. And we may even be insourcing, like in the government, when we pay contractors to really sit down and be the SOC personnel and sit next to us, and we're just doing the high-level stuff. The upper right is still the good work if you can get it zone, right? If you've got lots of people and lots of money, but the reality is that's where there's the only people who we could find using tools like the, all the fancy automation we here talked about and a lot of the tying protection, detection and protection together and automated playbooks and all that complex kind of stuff. The real issue is 
based on where you are, where's the most effective way to go? And this is where, again, where I think Chris's taxonomy did some cool things. So if, if I'm at that very low um, staffing skills and very low budget side, if I can convince them, let's send more people to SANS training or let's add headcount, either way, increase the level of skills, using some of those open source tools, maybe reducing how much you're outsourcing, get it down the first level of management and adding the, or of, uh, of uh, tiered uh, support and detection, and adding uh, the, those skills and those open source tools to add the Elk stack in, to, which was the number one of the top uh, rated ones when we did an open source tool survey of what hiring managers wanted their uh, incoming new employees to know. Hiring cybersecurity managers listed Elk stack uh, as one of the highest ones, along with the usual, you know, Bro, Zeek, Nessus, and all the typical open source tools. But this is a way from that taxonomy to pick out some of those key tools where you have gaps and reduce them without necessarily saying we have to spend lots of money on outside services or outside products. Second area was the opposite, where we already pretty high in our ability to spend on things, and we're doing a lot of that outsourcing, but uh, we got more money to increase the staff skills or, or size, and that's making a step towards automation. Re again, reducing some of what's outsourced, look at some of the um, simpler tools in Chris's taxonomy, like I call it network policy management, the ability to manage firewalls locally and out in the cloud with the same number of people, manage more tools with the same number of people, take the first steps of planning for uh, moving towards real automation, and that's checking that you do have um, playbooks that aren't just a giant one-note document somewhere, that everything is written down, that things are able to lend themselves to being transitioned to a little more automation, and then uh, when uh, more staffing comes in or more money comes in, moving up to those more complex tools. So this is adding those moderate tools in Chris's list, a mix of procurement and open source and the people skills to get there. The key thing that, that you can sh use this type of thing to show to management is it's not simply we need a procurement budget. You know, the number one thing I hear, I've heard from uh, security vendors in the automation space is, Often the, stat, the skills that the companies uh, we're trying to sell our products to aren't there to use our products, which is kind of interesting. When automation is supposed to solve the problem of needing staff, turns out, no, you need staff to use the automation tools, and they need fairly high skill levels to use them. So we can lay this type of thing out to management as a path for both investing in the people side of the equation and some in the product and services side of the equation, depending on which way we get the budget. The reality is very few of us are going to end up in the upper right but um, this we can show how we can make increases in performance. And then we have a whole other set of white papers I've done over the years here at SANS on metrics to use to convince the board, tying uh, SOC metrics and other metrics to be able to show monthly measurements to the board. We told you if we did this, we'd show a benefit. Here's the benefit. And track, track this type of uh, planning to the strategy, to the process, progress that's made, and demonstrating the business benefit.